Get your clickers ready. A uh, couple things. We're going to have a homework assignment, homework number three. Uh, and uh, concerning today's lecture and a few other things. And uh, I was going to try to get it ready by lunch, by uh, mid-afternoon today, so uh, hopefully it'll be ready then. But if not, it'll be, you know, lunchtime tomorrow. I kept thinking today was Tuesday, so instead of Thursday. But uh, anyways, homework three is coming. Also, uh, the, if you haven't already watched it, uh, see if you can track down the movie Hidden Figures and watch that. We'll be talking about that on Tuesday. Uh, and I had one other. Oh, the textbook. Uh, yeah, get the text. Raise your hand if you've, you're uh, on the textbook website. Okay, the rest of you, you better get on there because we're going to, we're going to have a chapter two mini review going here. It's ready, uh, and it's going to be part of your grade, so you got to get in there and get it. Question? You couldn't see where? The place to go to buy the book, I think the best one is grtep.com. Anybody use that website, grtep.com? I thought, what did you think? It was fairly basic? Yes. So, uh, Sedora, you know, grtep.com. And, yeah. And you got to go, it's, you got, it asks for what university you're in, right? And then, uh, and then you also have to select the section, I think, right? And this is section two. This is the 1030 section, so, okay, yeah. Anyways, you can get that done a little bit later. We're not quite ready for it, but uh, maybe Tuesday we will be. Uh, also want to remind you that today is the first official day of clicking for class participation. So 10% of your semester grade, 25 out of 25, hopefully, uh, starts today. It was supposed to start Tuesday, but we had to cancel lecture Tuesday. Um, now, just to remind you, class participation is class participation. So you actually have to be here for lecture. Now, with this many students, you know, we've got over, well over 400 students on the books here in the two, the two lecture sections. You, you do not have to tell me if you're missing a regular lecture because the participation grade incorporates or envisions that you're going to miss one or two lectures over the semester. And that's why if you answer 85% of all the questions between today and the end of November before finals week, uh, you'll get 25 out of 25, okay? And usually that means one or two lectures to burn, all right? So now th today we're going to have a bunch of questions on the, on the clicker. Uh, we're going to start in just a minute. And, uh, but you know, some days I only have one question and some days I have 10 questions. So I, I, and I, I never know at the beginning of the semester how many questions I'm going to have on the books at the end of the semester. So you just got to, but 85%, that's the, that's the expectation. And it usually boils down to one or two uh, regular lectures. All right, question over here. Yeah, I, I, did I talk to you in messages about that? I talked to somebody about that. It's Amazon, the only place to get the book right now is the grtep.com or the kindlehunt.com website. And, but grtep is the, the best. 
That's the actual website. That's the host of the, of the book. You know, on the KendallHunt.com, they're a regular textbook publisher. So they have, they have paper books, they have, uh, you know, e-books, and they have this website. Uh, but we don't have any. We just have the website. So, uh, but Amazon, that's going to be second edition. Your SOL. Uh, you got to have third edition. This is the only place to get the third edition. All right. So questions about clicking. Yes. How do you do the frequency DD thing? You mean you have a clicker? You ready to click? Well, let's get going. Let's review some of these velocity graphs. I'll show you how to do it in a second. Okay. We're good. No worries. Um, I'm going to, you know, ask you some questions, so go ahead and turn your clickers on. And if you haven't um, used your... If you haven't used your clicker for this class yet, what you've got to do is... Um, press down the power button for like two seconds and hold it. And then the rectangle in the upper left flashes and you type in DD. And then you'll get the Go Nitro message and then the, OK, uh, the Ready message. Did you get Go Nitro? You're ready to roll. Uh, so that's good. And um, let's get to the first question. Uh, who got a Go Nitro? Okay, here's the first question. Hopefully it's fairly easy. We're going to build up in difficulty. And as always, read carefully and think. Oh, oh gosh. As always, read carefully and use the right display. Sorry, here's the question. There we go. All right, let's see what we got here. Sorry about that. And hopefully this is cinchy, but we'll talk about it. Wow, 162 of yous. That's still about... 70 students short. Okay, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Come on. Okay, 208 students. Very nice. Um, yeah, this one, correct answer is A. Uh, look at answer B, constant velocity, 6 meters per second. Constant velocity means your, your velocity graph is flat, same speed. You know, whether it's a negative, you know, whether it's negative number, lower half of the graph, that would correspond to leftward motion, or, you know, uh, in the upper half, it's, it's flat if it's constant velocity. This one's not. Option C, there's no way to, to determine the position. Make a note of that. In a velocity graph, you cannot determine the position from the graph itself. It encodes the velocity, but it doesn't fully encode the position. You can use it to compute a new position. That's why we're studying it. But to get a new position, you, can, you have to use the velocity graph or the formula that encodes the graph, plus the initial position. And then you could think about a later position, right? But position itself, no. And so here's your, here's your at rest. So if, you're, if, you're, if your uh, velocity graph, the left-hand side, the early side of it is at the origin, that means it's at rest. All right, next question. Question two, object U. Little bit of complexity here, read carefully.
Let's see what you guys are doing here. Twenty seconds. You're doing good. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Excellent. Two hundred and eleven students voted. Good. That means most of you guys are on. Uh, yeah, this one's initially it's moving to the left. Right, that's what this, so this yellow box, you could write that down, and that actually could have been one of the options. Uh, it's moving to the left, speedometer reads nine meters per second. Now remember that a speedometer, if you see me on a test writing something about the speedometer, I'm telling you the speed, but not the direction. You know, you could be moving nine meters per second um, south towards Waterford Lakes, north towards Oviedo, west towards uh, racetrack uh, or east towards campus on, on university. And it, the speedometer doesn't tell you that. All right, so, you know, but the velocity graph does tell you the direction that you're moving. So if it's negatory in this, in this instance, it means to the left. All right, next question. And this one's a little trickier. Multiple choice, but you have to calculate the acceleration. Do you remember how to do that? <laughs> this graph def definitely allows you to compute the acceleration, the acceleration is encoded geometrically in this graph. And I see a bunch of you is consulting with your neighbors. Lovely, that's exactly what I want you to do. Today, but two, two Tuesdays from now on the exam one, no. But today, yes. You're doing good. Okay, uh, 30 seconds. Twenty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Um, yeah, most of you got that right. Eighty-two percent. Um, One point two meters per second per second. Uh, let's uh, let's figure out the, the actual uh, calculation. I'm sorry, this should be letter A for acceleration. A equals rise over run. I'll try to fix that before I YouTube it. Um, so on a velocity graph or from a velocity graph, you look at the rise over the run and that gives you the acceleration. Now for this one, the uh, rise is six meters per second uh, vertically on the graph. And the run is five seconds. And uh, you, so you can write, and then you take the quotient six over five, that's 1.2. And you can write it as 1.2 meter per second per second. And that, that means you don't have to use subscripts. And sometimes on a test, you'll see me write a multiple choice option with meter per second per second if I'm trying to save space. Uh, but, you know, uh, 1.2 meters per second squared down here in the, 
get my cursor over here. Come on, baby. Oh, that's the wrong. Yeah, use my trackpad. Hold on, here we go. 1.2 meters per second squared down here in the equation block. Yeah, that's, that's good. Either one of those is kosher. Now, you won't have to worry about that. You, you know, you won't have to worry about writing that in or clicking that in on an exam. But you'll see it on exams and you'll see it on homework, so just to, so you know. Okay, next question. Oh, by the way, I tempted 15 students to answer A. And A is incorrect because that's the, that's twice the area of the rectangle. You know, the, the, or excuse me, twice the area of the triangle, the distance triangle here. So, you know, you're 15 meters per second uh, is half of that. 0 0.83, 0 0.833 meters per second per second is uh, five over six. So that's, you know, the flip-flop of what you want. Negative 9.8 meters per second per second. You know what that is? It's free fall. Okay, so that's not what we got here. Uh, well, we're going to talk about free fall today, so, but that's not free fall. All right, which object, which statement about object W is true? Now, this one is going to burn your brains think maybe not ooh oh my goodness what is going on here Oh my goodness. I see a bunch of people writing stuff down in their notes, calculating something. Actually, this one you can calculate in your, oops. Twenty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, you guys that are getting here late, you're you're on the scoreboard now. It's good. Uh, yeah, let's take a look at this one. All right, so your interpretation uh, first, it's, it's the C is the correct answer. And what you want to do is look at the area of this distance triangle. Um, and you don't know the initial position, as I've mentioned before, but you can at least say that it's going uh, 15 meters to the right. Now, this is the correct notation here, D equals one half base times height. So triangle wise, I mean, if you're only looking at the, at the triangle and the triangle's got some simple round numbers, you can kind of do this in your head. You know, five times six is 30, divide by two, 15, All right? Or you can calculate the acceleration uh, and then square the time and then multiply them all together. Here's the plug-in for the base times height divided by two. And uh, here's the plug-in for the uh, acceleration formula, simple accelerated distance, uh, one half at squared. Remember, one half at squared is useful for calculating a distance uh, if you know that it's starting from rest or if you know that it's coming to a stop. If v equals zero describes either the initial point or the initial state or the final state. Initial state means it starts at rest. 
Final state means it comes to a stop. All right, and so the uh, one half at squared formula is co copacetic for that question. Uh, sorry, I'm just wondering how did you get 25 plus 3 to the quantity? Five seconds quantity squared. The question was, how do I get 25 seconds squared in the second parentheses down here in the second equation block? And the answer is, that's t squared. So the elapsed time is 5 seconds. Square that. You square the 5, 25. You square the seconds, second squared. Okay? And that's how you do it every time. In general, this is the formula. And this is a good formula for simple distance equations. Distance. So if I, if I ask you, you know, if, if you're at the top of the library and you drop a, a water balloon onto the sidewalk below, you're starting from rest. So you would use one half at squared with, you know, uh, uh, g instead of a. Right? I mean, a is completely general. G is for the free fall acceleration at the surface of the Earth. Matter of fact, let's, let's work on uh, the case of free fall. And what we're going to do with this is from talking about uh, distance triangles for, G, for free fall and stuff, we're going to refine the formula and actually uh, get a formula that I mentioned on day two, lecture two, uh, for the position in the y-coordinate of the position of an object like a baseball on a projectile path. And you may recall that from uh, two weeks ago, two Thursdays ago. Uh, yf equals yi plus viyt plus one-half gt squared. We're going to put that one all together today. All right, and we're going to st start by talking about free fall. Now, here's this famous picture of these guys jumping out of an airplane, oh my goodness. And you know, they don't even pull their ripcord. I don't know. Anyways, Galileo chose free fall as the simplest acceleration, and it's a good thing he did, and because he wanted to model all accelerating systems on that, and it turns out that doing that simple and easily observable free fall system, you know, that he can do from the Leaning Tower of Pisa or in, in his lab, it turns out that that allows us to figure out all the really complicated accelerations like a rocket blasting off from Kennedy Space Center and heading up to orbit or heading out to Mars, you know, for that matter, or one of the outer planets. Uh, so it's, it's really good. So it, it's because gravity is simple. Matter of fact, here's how he described it. If we now examine the matter carefully, we find no addition or increment of speed more simple than that which repeats itself always in the same manner. Now, that's a quotation from one of his books. He was a prolific writer. You know what's the cool thing? Um, in those days, you know, everybody was writing, you know, all the guys in the universities, they were writing in Latin. You know, no country actually spoke Latin. But in the universities, you had to know Latin, you know, academic Latin. But Galileo wrote in Italian, so it's pretty, which is close to Latin, but it's Italian. It's not the same thing. So he wrote in, in Italian most of the time. But he knew Latin. He was, he was a student of Aristotle that broke free. And this is actually today we're going we're gonna to talk about his day of his day of victory where he broke the empire of Aristotle, 2,000 years. See? It still resounds across the Internet. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so here's, here's this thing. He's going to drop, you know, uh, a cannonball or a musket ball or a donut, a cannoli. Uh, no, he probably wouldn't do that, but... He's going to drop something from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. He's going to start, start and stop his stopwatch. And, you know, he can measure it, you know, with a ruler, you know, work out the trig and everything. Figure out the height. And, you know, so, so he, but he's going to start from rest. So this is, this is like Galileo, the mischievous boy dropping water balloons, except 
He's not dropping water balloons. He's dropping cannonballs and stuff. But time t equals zero. Velocity, zero, the speed, 0, 0.0 meters per second. And it's downward. Now, after one second, he would have measured this, 9.8 meters per second of downward speed. And then it, it, it repeats itself always in the same manner for free fall. That's the cool thing about it. So the second second, ding, another 9.8 total, 19.6. All right. Now, he's, let's say he's at a little bit taller tower in Chicago. All right. He goes out to the... Has anybody here ever been to Chicago, that, that really tall Sears Tower? And you, you go out on a glass uh, terrace or something and you look down? Oh, my goodness. I would never want to do that. I've seen pictures of people doing that. Oh. Anyways, so this is a little bit taller building now because three seconds. Speed-wise, another 9.8, total 29.4. So here's the speedometer rating in the second column. You know, so he has a, 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 a cannonball with a speedometer. That's what the speedometer reads. And it's starting to get boring because four seconds, 39.4, that's 9.8 times four. Blah -de blah. And you just keep adding 9.8 for every second. So I'm just going to put dittos, et cetera. But make a note, this is downward speed. Direction is downward. All right, now we're going to encode that with a minus sign eventually. But the main point of this particular table is that the increase always repeats itself, always another 9.8 meters per second of downward speed. Now that's for something that's on the way down. He drops it from the, the top of the tower and it goes straight down. So it's always gaining speed downward. Now, if, if this were a baseball, and you know how if, if you have a pop-up, a fly, you know, sometimes the fly, it goes straight up in the air, comes straight back down, then the catcher catches it and you're out, right? And so if that was the case, on the way up, you wouldn't say it's gaining downward speed. You would say it's losing some of its initial upward speed. Go ahead and make a note of that. For an upward trajectory, it's losing upward speed. So if you hit a baseball um, and it's heading for the seats at the center field, at the center field bleachers, which is nice, it's got to get, you have to get it up in the air. So it's got to have a, at least a few meters per second of upward speed and a bunch of horizontal speed. Right, And so if it has some upward speed, it's going to lose 9.8 meters of upward speed for every second on its way up. But then after it gets to the top of its path, it's going to gain it all back because it's going to start falling down faster and faster and faster until it hits the uh, bleachers. All right. So um, this idea of uh, gaining downward speed is the same as losing upward speed. Now, it depends on your state of motion that you're in. So that being the case, we have equal increments for every delta t. That means we have a straight line segment. We've got a distance triangle, but which one? You know, the blue one up here is a negative slope, and uh, the pink one is a rise over run is positive. So, uh, you know, which kind of triangle do we, we have to use? Well, let's take a look at free fall. Let's try to work on this baby. And here's the generally accepted value at the surface of the Earth to two significant digits, 9.8. And if you go to the top of Mount Everest, it's going to be a little bit less. You know, but it's not going to show up in the 9.8. It's going to be... It's going to show up in the 9.807 or 072 or something like that. But pretty much everywhere from the top of Mount Everest to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the deepest part of the ocean, 9.8 is pretty good for free fall. 
All right now, uh, an astronaut up in the space station, they're actually in free fall up there. We, we think of it as zero gravity, you know, like, but gravity hasn't disappeared. Gravity is keeping them on their orbit. They are in free fall. And the fact is that their trajectory, they're on a trajectory that they're, they're falling and they're trying to fall to the earth, but they're going so fast that the earth curves away from them faster or at the same rate as they curve around the earth. So they just keep going around the earth and they never catch up to the earth. They never get to the, to the ground until they fire their retro rockets and deorbit and stuff like that. But, but uh, those guys are technically in free fall. But up there, the free fall velocity, the free fall acceleration is a little bit less because gravity gets weaker with altitude. And up on the moon, you have a completely different a completely different celestial object and gravity's a lot weaker up there. It's like 1.6, something like that, meters per second squared. And you can see that uh, if you ever look at the old timey videos of Apollo astronauts and you could see them, you know, their muscles are strong enough so that in, in, on Earth, they could probably jump a foot or so off the ground inside those big moon suits. But up on the moon where gravity is weaker, they still have all that muscle power. That's not gravitational, it's chemical in your muscles, that's, that's chemistry. And they have all that power, and so they can really, you know, they jump like Michael Jordan up there on the moon, you know? So it's kind of cool if you ever see those movies, those guys jumping and sliding around, it's pretty cool. All right, so let's get down to the, the drop distance situation here. For, um, for free fall. Now here's a velocity graph for free fall and this one has the minus sign encoded into it. That means that, and this one, I'm starting from rest. So this is you at the top of the library dropping a, a water balloon, all right? And in the first second, 9.8 meters per second. Time t equals two seconds. You're at negative 19.6 meters per second. Now that table that we were just looking at, we just had speeds. This one is velocity. The minus sign here and the location on the graph gives you the direction. And this is vertical. So this is heading downward. So that table, I added the, the little blurb at the very bottom, downward velocity or downward speed. I had to add the word downward here I have a minus sign and I graph in the bottom half below the time axis. And that encodes the direction of motion. All right, now let's put in the distance triangle. All right, there it is. Go ahead and shade that in. And the vertical part of it, delta V, that's the change in velocity from t equals zero seconds to t equals, uh, in this case, four seconds. Uh, that's G delta T. And this is using negative 9.8 meters per second squared for G. So make a note of that. Here you have to use negative 9.8. All right, and that'll allow you to get a position. Now, if all you want is the distance, just do one half base times height. You know, that's, you know, one half base times height is, is always kosher, but you have to know how to use it. If you're just doing a distance, you know, which is good. You know, how far is it below me? You're up at the top. How far is it dropping? Yeah, that's one half times 9.8 times the square of the time. All right now, here's the time, delta T, the elapsed time, four seconds in this for this diagram. And yeah, you could use this formula. This this formula D. Whenever I say distance, I'm looking for a positive number. All right, so you don't have to put the not negative inside this one. In the velocity graph, yes, you do. And if you were using the velocity graph to find a position, you would have to use negative 9.8. But if all you want is a distance, distance is different from position. They're related, but they're not the same. Position can be any number, positive or negative. You know, x-axis, negative over here to the left, positive over here to the right, y-axis, Positive up here to the top, negative down, you know, down below the x-axis. 
Right? So position, you've got to be able to roll with negatives and positive, but just distance. So write that down, distance, positive number. Position could be positive or negative, you know, depending on how you set up your graph paper. All right? So for the dropped, and, and this is the, the third, or not the third, I think it was actually number eight, uh, the little shrimpy kid with the water balloons in homework two. All right, so we're going to do another uh, example of that uh, from the minds of Moria with Peregrine Took. Uh, but what we're going to do is uh, numeric input. So I want you to hit the refresh key on your calculator. And let me get this going. Question. Distance is a positive number. That's what, a dist, you, never, you never think of a, a distance as being a negative. So distance is always a positive number. But position can be either positive or negative, depending, you know, so x position, x coordinate, can be a positive or a negative number depending on how you set up your graph paper. A positive or negative y coordinate, depending on how you set up your graph paper. All right, so hit the, uh, hit the refresh key and um, it's going to, what does it start yet? One? Yeah. Okay. And you're going to answer uh, with the decimal point in this question. Uh, and I'll give it to you in a second. And the, you guys, uh, the decimal point is really hard to see. So try to put on your specs. See if you can do it. Here, here's your question. You drop a rock down the well, just as Pippin did in the mines of Moria. You hear the splash at 3.2 seconds. How deep is it? Go ahead and calculate that. And, you know, consult with your neighbors and kibitz with your neighbors and stuff. Of course, this is the famous part of the movie where Peregrine Took gets them all in trouble. You know, almost gets them all greased. So type in your answer the nearest uh, something point something something meters. All right? And I'm looking at what you guys got over here. Just do it carefully. And be mindful of the Be mindful of the uh, decimal point. Very good. Ellie, did you get it? Good. Round off carefully. I see some people here with numbers that are <sighs> double check. You could change your answer. You could type it in again if you want. And just hit the send key and it'll it'll record your the last thing you type in is what it'll Whoa. Something point something something.
One minute. Thirty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Two, one. Let's see what you guys got. Uh, let me show you what, what we've got. Okay. There's a big pile of answers uh, at 50 point, let me move this out of the way here, 50.18. And 50.18 is the correct answer. Uh, raise your hand if you got 50.18. Excellent, good. Uh, and I'm just gonna scan a few. Now look at this, 51.5.12, that's, they got the decimal point, but they didn't have it in the right place. Now, 5018, that means, to me, this is five people that didn't get the decimal point. Uh, they thought they had it, but they didn't. So now, 50.12, uh, 50.17, that's a little bit of round off problem. 50.2, the same. So uh, bear that in mind when, when we're doing exams and stuff. Uh, uh, you want to be able to. Um, calculate the answer accurately, but also um, it be I, just as I looked at all those different answers, I can give partial credit to some of those that, you know, like they blooped up the decimal point or something like that. It's not a correct answer, so they don't get full credit, but you can still get some partial credit. All right, here's the calculation. Uh, one half GT squared, it's a distance. We're just asking how far down is the well. We're not asking for where is it on my graph paper. So uh, all you need is a positive 9.8 meters per second squared. And here's your calculation. Now, this one, I'm going to go through these st step by step as if you are doing it on pencil and paper. Now, I know most of you guys use your calculators on your cell phone or something. But on the exam, if you forget your, calcul your regular calculator and you can't use your cell phone on exam, you're going to have to do it on pencil and paper. It might look like this. So what I normally do is, uh, you know, here's my plug-in over here, 0 0.5 for 1 half, 9.8 meters per second squared for G, and 3.2 seconds, and then quantity squared for the T squared. That's the drop time. Okay, now my first term here in, parent in the second equation of the equation block, the parentheses is uh, five, 0 0.5 times 9.8. So uh, that's kind of an intermediate step, 4.9 meters per second squared. And then 3.2 quantity squared. 3 squared is 9. So 3.2 squared is going to be a little bit bigger than that. So if, this, if, I'd, if I'd done this on my calculator and come up with 15.3, then I might have thought, ooh, that's a little bit too high. Let me do that again and hopefully get it right. 10.24 is right and then second squared again because we're squaring everything inside the brackets and then we cancel second squared so go ahead you want to see that again okay fill in okay and there's second squared in the denominator inside the parentheses and then second squared in the numerator inside the square bracket and here we go i'm going to burn them out of there 
Okay, so cancel those. But you can't cancel the, the meters, which is all right. That's kosher because it's a distance we're trying to figure out. So we better not be able to cancel out meters. We want to have some meters left for the answer. Okay, so 50.176. And then you say, all right, now what did Dr. B ask for? Okay, the nearest something point something something. Ding. 50.18. All right, now, on exams and on homework, hopefully you've gotten the idea that I will always tell you how I want you to round off, and I'll give you a little example. All right, now, I usually do that on exams, homework, and in lectures. Sometimes I forget, but most of the time I've got it. All right, so don't worry about that. But do worry about how to interpret this and stuff. You know, I'm going to help you with, or I'm going to make it clear what the, the basic math stuff is. I'm not... It's not a math class. Um, this is a thinking, physics thinking class. So we want to interpret and use the formulas in a, a proper way. And, uh, and 9.8 positive meters per second squared is kosher if you're just doing a distance. You know, how many meters, you know, for my position. But if you're, if you're trying to figure out a position on graph paper, um, yeah, you got to use the negative, all right? So position, yeah, I want to use negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, we're going to do that now, and we're going to put together Galileo's formula that we had on uh, lecture two. You know, yf equals yi plus viy times t plus one-half gt squared. We're going to put that all together. Remember this, the diagram of the baseball? The arc of the baseball is a parabolic arc. And this is the first half of its motion. Um, and this is the rise of the baseball hit towards the outfield somewhere or towards the cheap seats in center field. So we're going to put this together. And what we're going to compute is this distance. All right, so go ahead and make a sketch of that. And you can see that I've got graph paper underlying here. The underlayment here, the background image is graph paper. All right, so to, to reinforce that we're trying to set up a position on graph paper. All right, now that bracket there is the change in the position between the final position, YF, at the top of the arc, and the initial position down here uh, at this first, let me get my cursor, at this first red dot over here on the left. Okay, the elevation there is Y subscript I. So that would be like zero. I mean, if you're, if, if, you know, for home plate. Or you could make it one meter for the, the height of the bat when he actually hits the ball, you know, about a meter off the ground. But whatever it is, a YF is the final position, and that involves um, some initial velocity and some accelerations. It's an accelerated, it's a curved trajectory. All right, so here we go. Let's put it all together. So my final coordinate on the y-axis, and we're not, we're not tackling the x-coordinate yet. We'll do that on Tuesday next week. Um, Got to have the starting position, yi, y subscript i. Now this part, viy times t, that's a distance rectangle. If there were no gravity... That would be all you need to figure out the future position. Because you know, the gravity is changing the speed, but if there's no gravity, that's all you got. That's all you're going to get. And if you think about a baseball, if you're, if you're hitting an arc to the outfield, you've got to have a little bit of upward VIY to start with. So that might be you know, 24.7 meters per second VIY. All right? And if it is then it's going to start upward and it's going to lose 9.8 meters per second uh, for every second of upward flight until it gets to the very top. And at the very top, it's got zero meters per second of vertical speed. But then on the back half of the trajectory, on the way back down to the bleachers, you gain it all back. All right. Anyways, this is the first half of the motion. So then here's one half gt squared, and this encodes the fact that it's slowing down. And notice that this thing is, it comes to a, a flat, the curve flattens out at the very top. 
The tangent line, you know, let me put my, my cursor right above the letter V. Okay, if you drew in a tangent line, it would, you know, be tilted at about, I don't know, 40 degrees or something. And if you did a tangent line over here by the baseball, it'd be a little bit flatter, you know, like 30 degrees maybe. And if you do a tangent line right up here at the top of the arc, the tangent line is completely flat on this curve. And then it starts, on the way down, the tangent line starts tilting the other way and tiltier and tiltier until it hits the seats out in the, out in the bleachers. Now, let's, let's wrap this up. Let's put it all together. All right, so Y subscript I, that encodes where you started. All right. And then you have a distance rectangle because you have to give it some vertical speed. And you're going to lose it to gravity, but this encodes the initial speed that you would have at the outset, the initial vertical speed. Now, we're not doing anything. You know, those things, if, if it's a straight pop-up, this is all you got to do. But if it's heading to the outfield, as this, as this picture shows, you're going to have some VIX. You know, so, and hopefully it's got enough VIX and enough VIY to make it all the way to the, the bleachers and you get a home run. But anyways, this is a distance triangle, excuse me, a distance rectangle. And if there were no gravity, if you were out in space somewhere, out in the solar system, and hit the baseball and the VIY, that's all you got. That's all you're going to get. There's no change. It's just going to keep on going, you know. But if you're in a gravitational field, you get this baby. And that's the distance triangle, all right? So this equation encodes the initial position plus a distance rectangle and a distance triangle, all right? Also, this will work for any free fall uh, situation that you can think of. So if you were to go to the top of the library and instead of dropping it, you know, this is, if you go to the library and drop it from rest, VIY is zero. And you get one half GT squared over there. Right? You still have to, in this equation, you still have to use negative 9.8. But, you know, so that means it would be below your position with a negative, you know, below, you know, you're at, if you're up on top of the library, YI is, is you, know, you know, 40 meters up in the air or whatever the height of the library is, okay? And so um, your position later is going to be negative to that, and that's incorporated in the minus sign in the G, all right? Now, if you're up there on top of the library, and you, th you, you know, you th okay, I see a buddy of mine over by the fountain or by the, the wading pool. What do you call that thing? The reflection pool, okay, for spirit splash. Uh, freshman, newbie freshman, every year we have spirit splash. Do, duh, is anybody on the O team or does anybody know what day spirit splash is? It's coming up. And it's disgusting to think about. Everybody's dirty, smelly feet in the water, and you're, I don't, anyways. And it's, that, it's pretty cool, though, thousands of people out there. It's pretty fun. Anyways, so if you see, so if you see your buddy, you're up on the top of the library, and you got a perfectly good water balloon, and you see your roommate or your roommate's girlfriend or something, uh, well, let's just say your roommate. Let's say your roommate, you want to you give him a, a little bit of a surprise, and you gotta, you, you can't drop it because he's not right below you. He's out by the, the pool, so you gotta, you gotta give it a little. You gotta loft it. Right? You gotta give it a little bit of loft, a little bit of VIY, to get it all the way out there to the to the, the waiting pool. Uh, but if he's actually in close, you could do, you could, you could aim it downward. Okay, I can see him down there, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna aim a little high but I'm still going to throw it down, you throw it downward, then VIY would be negatory, you know? And that's, you know, this thing will handle it. You know, so VIY could be zero, it could be negative, it could be positive. You can handle it all. And it's all going to transform into a parabola, which I'll, I'll show you on Tuesday next week.
And it's, it's actually in the, I think at the end of chapter 2, if I'm not mistaken, where all that stuff uh, transforms into a parabola. Uh, anyways, um, small homework 3 assignment. Actually, it's going to be a regular size assignment. When I, when I made this this morning, I was thinking it was still Tuesday, and I had to make a small assignment. So it's going to be a regular size homework 3. Uh, and we'll, I'll give you, I have a couple problems that will help you trot you through this equation just to give you a feel for it. And I might give you a few extra attempts so you can, you know, in case you crash and burn on your first two attempts and then you go into discussion, you know, you can get a clue. Now, that equation is perfectly fine to track the y coordinate of a Ferrari that somebody drives off of a cliff, which they do in the movies. All right, and you can figure out the parabola and everything. But that particular trajectory is something that became an object of argumentation between Aristotle and well, between Galileo and the ghost of Aristotle, you know, I mean, Galileo was making an argument contra Aristotle's teachings. Uh, so I'm going to describe this as if Aristotle and Galileo are talking to each other. Um, and they were talking about the nature of motion itself. And Galileo was thinking about this projectile motion of a Ferrari driving off a cliff. Uh, and Aristotle said, every motion in the physical world requires some kind of a mover, a force. It's all, there's always some kind of a force. And so he was thinking about things and, you know, he, you know, people give Aristotle a bad name, but I mean, he was doing the best he could. And Galileo, I mean, he would, you know what, if, if he had been alive when Galileo came up with this following argument, he would have said, bravo, Galileo, you did it. Because it's fantastic. This is, the, this is the beginning of physical science right here. When Galileo made this argument, he, he, he broke the empire of Aristotle. And you know, we've been following his footsteps since then. Galileo said, yes, there are forced motions, but also... There are unforced uh, motions which do not accelerate, neither slow down nor speed up. And he said, you can think of, a, of a, a horizontal plane that's frictionless, perfectly horizontal, so there's no tilt to it. But eventually, when you come to the end of that plane, you know, if you send something in motion along that plane, it will, Galileo said, it will stay in motion at at the same speed. It won't slow up, it won't slow down, and it'll keep going the same direction until it gets to the end of, the, of this hypothetical horizontal plane. And then it will go into free fall, like a Ferrari driving off a cliff. All right, so, uh, so this horizontal frictionless plane, hypothetical, he said an object is indifferent, and emphasize that word indifferent, because in Italian, that's, that's how it translates from Italian. It's a difference of being at rest or in motion. So it doesn't, it doesn't really notice the fact that it's in motion or not. If it's in motion, it'll stay in, in motion at constant velocity until it leaves the plane. In other words, until the Ferrari drives off the cliff. All right? But if it's at rest, you know, it, it's perfectly fine. It, it doesn't care. You know, it's perfectly fine being in constant velocity or perfectly fine being at rest. And if it's at rest, you know, it's just sitting up there, it doesn't drive off the cliff. But what Galileo said is, it's, the key is that there's no force on it. It's, there's no tilt to the, you know, if there's a tilt, you know, if you tilt a, a horizontal plane, you're gonna get a little bit of gravity, just like we did with the, with the uh, skateboarder on the aisle. Who's the skateboarder? Rachel, where are you at, Rachel? Okay, Rachel the skateboarder. Okay, when she came down the aisle, that was like a ramp. There's a little bit of tilt to it. But, she, you know, if, if she was uh, standing on her, on her uh, skateboard down here at the front where the, where the ground is level, she could stand there uh, till the cows come home, and she ain't going nowhere. She's at rest. 
All right, so that would be a horizontal. Now, down here on the floor, there's a carpet and there's a lot of friction. And plus, she has good wheels on her skateboard, but they're not perfect. So there's a little friction in the, the bearings and stuff. But, but anyways, Galileo was saying this ideal hypo hypothetical frictionless plane. There's no, you know, there's no tilt to it, so there's no automatic roll down. All right? But so you can still have constant velocity up there. All right? until it drives over the cliff. So um, he said that, he, and Aristotle would have said, no way, Jose. If you're up there on this hypothetical uh, plane and you're, okay, you're a constant motion, but you still have to have some, a little bit of force to push you along in, in, in motion. That's what Aristotle would have said. And Galilee said, no, man. That, that's, that doesn't compute. It doesn't work out. And Aristotle wasn't thinking the way it, that Galileo was thinking. And we're going to prove that now. We're going to go into his proof. And this is where he, he puts the master stroke into the empire of, Ga, of Aristotle. And he cracks it, cracks it in half. And Aristotle would have said, good job. Good job, Luke. Just like Luke Skywalker. So let's, let's uh, set this up. According to you and Aristotle, the object will move along the horizontal plane of Galileo only if it experiences a little bit of push force. All right, so let's put a, let's put a car in. Use your car. It's not, a, it's not a Ferrari, but okay, we'll start small. And let's say that all right, Aristotle says, all right, you need a bit of push force, constant speed, V equals constant. And Galileo says, uh, V equals constant. And Aristotle says, yeah, okay, but you've got to have a little bit of push force. So let's say 0 0.02 metric units of push force. All right? And that's what Aristotle would have insisted on. Aristotle would have said, no, you can't, even frictionless, it's nice, good, but you still need a push force up there to keep it in motion. So Galileo said, all right, let's take, we'll take what you got. He said, all right, we got this, we got this horizontal plane. It's frictionless. Um, and we also have a weight force acting on the car. Now, this is important. That weight force is important because if the hypothetical plane has got a little tilt, that weight force is going to send it in, you know, downhill. All right? So you can't ignore, I mean, it's hypothetical, frictionless and flat, it's horizontal. So the weight force doesn't do anything when it's horizontal, but it's there. And as soon as you get to the end of the horizontal surface, then gravitation takes over and you, you, know, you curve down on a para, uh, parabolic arc. So Galileo says, yeah, all right, uh, 0.02 metric units of force. And let's say that it's got 0 0.100 metric units of weight force. So go ahead and write that one down. And so, so Aristotle said, all right, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, that's true. Because you know, Aristotle knew about gravity. I mean, everybody knows about gravity, you know. So force, it forces you downward, you know. And so, um, so Galen says, yes, very, very nice conjecture. My wonderful professor Aristotle but this car also has a bit of weight force, W, and let's say that it's uh, 0 0.100 metric units of force. So now, and Galileo, and so Aristotle says, okay, good. Okay, grasshopper, what do you got? Show me what you got. And Galileo says, okay, let me show you what I got here. So what Galileo does, he, he copies the push force. Right, see that? I made a copy of it. And Galileo says, I'm going to copy the weight force. So there's the weight force arrow. And notice that these things, I gave them numbers so that they have a specific ratio. Now the push force is 0 0.02 metric units of force. And the weight force is 0 0.10. So the ratio is 5 to 1. Go ahead and make a note of that. The weight force is five to one with the push force. The push force is one to five with the weight force. You could write it that way if you like. Now what we're gonna do here, I'm gonna park these copies over here. So Galileo says, okay, 
I'm going to copy these two vectors and I'm going to make my push force vertical and I'm going to make my weight force arrow, I'm going to copy it, but I'm going to make it into the hypotenuse of a right triangle. All right. Now Galileo's saying, what? Or, or Aristotle's saying, what? Hold on, son. Hold on, sonny. But he's, and Galileo says, well, come on, it's true, right? Yeah, I can do that if I want. It's just all theoretical, it's all hypothetical. Okay, Galileo, keep going. So here's what Galileo says. On this ramp, the height of the ramp is one, and the length of the ramp is five. Now, you can build that. You can go out and get a five-foot board, and then get another one-foot board, and make a ramp like that. No problem. And it all started with uh, Aristotle saying, all right, 0.02 metric units of force. So Galileo said, all right, let's, I, can make a, I can make this ramp. The, the, length, the, the, the height to hypotenuse ratio is 1 to 5. Hypotenuse to height is 5 to 1. All right? So now, now watch. So, so Aristotle nods his head and says, okay, I got you. We can make this. Let's go. You know, so they go down to Home Depot, they get some wood, and they build a ramp. Okay, good. All right, Galileo, yeah, okay, 1 to 5, got it. Ramp, nice, very good. What's next? And Galileo says, all right, now I'm going to rotate my, my pair of vectors together so that now the small push, what used to be the push force, is now heading down the ramp at the same tilt angle as the ramp. And the weight force is back to being vertical. And Galileo says, if you have a, a, a ramp of this size, this is the ramp that gives you 0 0.02 uh, metric units of force from gravity. And gravity's push, and gravity's accelerating, just like. Rachel accelerated down the ramp. She didn't have the full force of gravity because she was on a ramp. We measured it. And Galileo says, you're overestimating Aristotle. If you say that something's, if you agree that you can have constant motion for this car and 0 0.02 new, uh, metric units of force to keep it at that speed, I can show that no. That's the amount that you get from a ramp that's tilted. A horizontal uh, uh, surface is going to be less than that. Okay, so the, the flat plane will require less than that. You know, because the, the, you know, and so first plane, a uh, flat plane requires less than 0 0.02. But here's the worst part of it for Aristotle. No matter what Aristotle says, if Aristotle says, okay, maybe I overestimated, let's call it 0 .002. And Galileo could go out and build a ramp for that and say, no, we get that. We, that doesn't require, you know, horizontal ramps don't need that. that. You know, you get that from a ramp at this tilt angle. And so Aristotle could go, okay, all right, all right, okay, I got it. Well, let's just make it a little smaller, 0 .0002. And Galileo could say Come on, you know I got gotcha. you. You know, no matter what you propose, any positive number for any object, he can always build a ramp that corresponds to that force, which means that a, hor a perfectly horizontal surface, in other words, not a ramp, it's perfectly flat, that corresponds to zero force. And that busted, that busted Aristotle. Now, as I said, Aristotle, if he were alive at the time, he would have said, good job. But it, it stirred up a hornet's nest when, when Galileo, you know, he got in a lot of trouble. With, 
You know who he got in trouble with? He didn't get in trouble so much with the, the Catholic Church so much as, as all the other university professors and stuff around Italy that were on his case. But, he, you know, anyways, he, he did, this, is the, this was the, the fundamental argument that cracked open that Aristotle's empire. But Aristotle, you know, as I said, he would have been, he would have been happy. Aristotle was a good guy. You know, we don't always learn everything as fast as we want. Uh, but we just got to be honest and humble about it. And, and we'll, we'll learn and keep building and building and building. Now, we sometimes call this, you know, this, this hypothetical horizontal plane, frictionless, constant velocity, uh, an object with no forces acting on it or with balanced forces, uh, it'll stay in a state of motion, constant speed, constant direction, and we sometimes call that the inertial state. And th this idea of Galileo, that this hypothetical state exists, where an object is in it with no forces or with balanced forces acting on it is going to continue in the same direction at constant speed. That is his law of inertia. So write that down, the law of inertia. And it actually became the first law of Newton's three laws of motion, which we're going to study in chapter 3. So your homework assignment, and I'm going to dismiss now, we're a little few minutes early. Um, your homework, homework is, going is going to be homework three. three. Read, Read into chapter, chapter three. Start, start scheme chapter, chapter three, three and all of chapter two. And, and try to try look at, to look at uh, hidden figures in the movie. And I'll see, and I'll you, see guys you guys on Tuesday. Tuesday. You're, dismissed. You're dismissed.